we're not in London anymore. Welcome to Barcelona. My name is Alona, I'm a milliner based in London and today I have joined Cristina de Prada, a milliner based in Barcelona. Hi, how are you today? Fine, I'm glad to have you here. Oh well, thank you so much for letting us come and visit you in your flat because you work from home, just like me. Yes, just like many, many milliners. And is it quite difficult trying to fit into a small flat with all the equipment and stuff that comes with millinery? Yes, it is a problem because we tend to sort of invade every little nook and cranny in the flat. So <laughs> probably <laughs> you have the same experience. Yes, so. Mr. Hat knows all about that. <laughs> all my stuff is everywhere, but you've also got a handy little storage space, don't you? Yes, also known as The Bunker. I love that. What a fun name. I've seen videos of you um, filming in it on Instagram and I wouldn't really describe it as a bunker, more of an Aladdin's cave of hat blocks. <laughs> oh, yeah, wow. and material also. <gasps> oh my goodness, it's never ending. Look, there's more behind the corner. That is an incredible amount of space and it's so tall as well. Yes, I love it because I have another storage room, but it's the, the ceiling is really low. And when I realized that uh, these ones were had high ceilings, as I said, I had to I have to get one. Wow. So, so I, is this part of, of the flat or you have to sort of purchase it separately? Uh, you have to purchase it separately. So the, the, the small one I have. We bought it with a flat and this I bought recently and uh, had the shelves made because it was getting out of hand because I have all the, like, we bought with, uh, together with Nina some vintage uh, felt. So I have, you know, like uh, blues and pinks and blacks and reds and greys, greens. And, and then I have all these straw material that also we bought all that is straw braid which is ridiculous because Amazing. i don't use it and i should use it well you've got the uh, straw braid machines i saw i do i have to sort of uh, pick that up again but the, it's like yeah it, it needs some some practicing but i love it it's like magic the braid machine it's you just go from nothing to a hat and you can do it freehand mm -hmm. you can block but you can freehand a hat which mm -hmm. is great and it's my dream to find one i haven't yet saved up quite enough to afford one but oh, one day one yeah. day i'll get there <laughs> so i have uh, here are my my blogs that go on high up and uh yeah these are the kind of uh cork blocks that I make. This is like a normal block. This is for the famous... Ah, the pea pods. pods. Amazing. Do you do a class on carving the cork blocks? I, do, I might be doing one next year in Spain, but I don't... I did one for the British Millennium Association um, on making a bandeau mm -hmm. one. This is for a hat I made, it's like a bow. Ah, anyway, yes. <laughs> I've noticed you're storing the blocks in plastic. I don't close it, so it's open oh. always, because I think it would be moldy. Because how, what is, well, now it's not so humid, but it can be very humid. So I, they are covered, but they are not not sealed, they're Not breathing. Sealed. You're breathing, mm. hopefully. Okay. Because my, my hat block storage, and um, some people on, on YouTube will have seen my version of a bunker, which is my boiler room cupboard. I worry about humidity more for the felts, mm. but for the, for the wood, I think it's not so terrible if it's a little bit more on the humid side than the dry side. Some hat blocks I've never used. I have never used this one, but I'm just amazing. 
Oh wow! And it's, it's no... a it's a puzzle hat block. Incredible. Yes, They're my favorite type as well. Because if you've one once struggled to a block a uh, a beret or something like mm. that, you come to appreciate this kind of block. Yeah, and they're magical. Yeah, I've got a a beret block. It's like a really big donut-y style beret and I blocked on it and I could not get the felt off. Oh. So I'm, I'm thinking of maybe I could take my uh, big block to a hat block maker and see if they can saw it into five pieces for me. Yes, <laughs> that would be good. You would be losing, because there's some wastage I think, mm. you would be losing on the head size but it's a beret you can always stretch. So yes. there's no system here? Uh, there's, uh, there used to be, but it, there is no no system anymore. It's just uh, things piled up. Most hat blocks, I buy them in Germany. Mm, yes, there's a lot of vintage blocks. Yeah, from and Germany. The, the price is reasonable. Yes, I agree. Can with be. That. Yeah, can be. So, but yeah, yeah there's. I don't know. They're wacky. Mm. Mm. And you don't know Ooh. how is that gonna turn that's out. That's fun. That's like a clamshell hat, one of yes. my favourite styles. You don't really see that worn today. I'm I'm on a bit of a mission every now and again to try and make some vintage styles more popular. But and these are weird. They must have been used with some sort of machine, something that generated heat because they're like always like dark here, like burnt. Mm. So something weird going on mm. also i don't know if you have that thing that you see you buy an old block and you see pinholes in places you think why yes why is there a pinhole here what, yes. what where it what were they doing yes i've had that and i've also had had blocks where actually the opposite where there weren't pinholes somewhere where i would put a pin in and i'm thinking well th this is this is very odd as well yes that makes me worry i like them with pinholes because I think they've been successfully blocked and they were successful hats yeah. when there's like lots of, of, of pins in it like on this one. Oh yeah. Like it's well oh, used. Yes. Also when you buy old hat blocks just run your fingers and try to find out if there are pins sticking out. Yes. You don't want to injure yourself and I've got a video on restoring vintage hat blocks so if you do have a vintage hat block that you'd like to restore go and check that one out. I'll link it in the top right as well. How did you get started in millinery? Like all of us who make hats, um, I uh, always loved hats and wore hats when I was little and um, I never thought about making hats but uh, I was uh, like 25 years ago or something like that. I was in Amsterdam uh, in a shop that doesn't exist anymore. And uh, it was a hat shop, but they had hat blocks. And I had, can you believe, I had never thought about how are hats made. And I saw the wooden blocks and I was like, oh, that's how it's made. I can do that. And so I, I asked if they sold a blocks I didn't and in the end I just uh, bought new blocks and uh, started there. Interesting so I sort of had a very similar experience when I realized that what you do is essentially you take your material and you stretch it over a block. You also make your own blocks I spy over there a little a little cork number. Yeah I love this material it's easy to pin on. I wouldn't know how to start uh, making a, a wooden hat block. This is doable and uh, the curved ones I do with thin uh, cork that I build up in layers mm. and uh, I love that I can do my own thing and it's mine and nobody has uh, the same one. You've got a hat behind you, you were showing your cork block that you made specifically for that one and that's the Bez Ben hat entry and I can't quite remember what you called it. Stormy weather. Stormy weather. It's so perfect with the newspaper on it and the leaves flying around. It's, I'm pretty proud of that hat. It's, it's so great. I love it. <laughs> what inspires you when you start thinking about making a hat? The thing about competitions that not everybody is keen on, but it, for me it's a great source of inspiration because it makes me think out, outside of the box. It makes me 
consider I had that I would never have thought of. But it's because there is a theme and there you there is a brief that I like it and uh, that the weirdest things come as a result. Also, if uh, if I am making a hat to match a garment, that is the source of inspiration. I get inspired a lot by matching hats to dresses. I'd say that's very much my thing. I actually really struggle with competition briefs because I sort of find that they're too open-ended and I like to really sort of do something very specific. So I really admire all your work and the creativity in that. One thing is making a hat that you're gonna wear um, that you for everyday life and those hats need to be practical and you know need to be wearable and then there's making a hat for a special occasion like for the hat straw or uh, for a competition and and when with competitions i i know that the brief is open-ended very always there is you know you can anything you just explain a little bit and it it fits in (laughs) But I try to do something that will surprise the judges or and that will um, make the judge curious about how, how is that made? How did you make that? Or and that's the kind of thing. And then you have to go off the beaten path and do something weird. And I think I also have the advantage of that, I, though I have been trained by some very good milliners a lot of my path has been uh, of uh, you know training myself and um, through books and and then you have to find your own way of doing things and I think that is a great advantage I have um, over people now uh, younger people who are they think oh, the answer must be on the internet. Mm-hmm. The answer must be there. And they don't think. They just go and, and they ask. And it's like, well, I don't know what. You try it and let us know how it went. No? It's like, how would this work? You try it mm-hmm. and you tell me. <laughs> Why, what's, you know, then people are a bit, oh, I don't know. And I, and I love it that I just had to, to learn on my own. Yeah, so as, a, as of that younger millennial internet generation, it's sort of one of the reasons why I started posting to the internet, because I wanted to make sure that um, th- I, I like the idea of having my experiments recorded so that people can look at them and go, ah, okay, she's experimenting, now I want to experiment too. So not so much of this is how you must do things, but more of a encouragement to other younger milliners starting out who might be searching the internet yes. and hopefully finding that millinery is all about experimentation and finding your own path. It's not just about going to this course and then doing this course and then doing this course, but it's very much um, a self-taught craft. And I think to a certain extent, it's always sort of been like that. Well, also there is a bright side to the whole thing is that now you can do these online courses or in, you know you can be there and, and learn things when i started there was nothing there was absolutely uh, there was no way you could learn in barcelona for example and there was not i couldn't find any way of learning other than contacting a milliner and say can i go and learn with you mm-hmm. and now it's well, it's wonderful and it's great <laughs> yes do all the courses but then do your thing mm, yeah. also do your thing do your thing <laughs> i mean don't go around like like um, it happens to nina a lot my my friend and colleague nina Pawlowski. She organizes the hat stroll with me. She does a lot of teaching and people come with a photo of a hat of uh, Philip Tracy or Stephen mm-hmm. Jones. I want to do this. And it's like, no, no, mm-hmm. you don't want to. You can be inspired. Yeah. That's great. And also know that everything has been done already. And I, I have that feeling because I love to browse through all magazines and uh, and such amazing things have already been done everything's been done 
I quite agree with you. I, I do also think that pretty much everything that can be done has been done, unless maybe there's some new materials invented. I love to look at old hats, what's been done already, more than looking at contemporary millionaires. I try to avoid that because that sort of can pollute your, you know, just seep into what you're doing. You don't want what to do yeah. your thing. Do your thing. Yeah, you don't want to copy the, the modern milliners, but no. it's, it's easier to get inspired, I think, by looking at extant designs. Like um, yes. you did some filming for the Balenciaga exhibition that I also have a video on, which I will link to in the top right. Beautiful. <laughs> Everything was gorgeous. And I, you know, that was my excuse to get to see the hats up close. I thought I I'm going to so tell them jealous. I want to film it. And, uh, <laughs> And, and they will open the door for me, and, and they did, and I, well, I, I love it. I was so jealous, because obviously that was during the pandemic, so yes. I, couldn't, I couldn't make it over here to see, but I, I got in contact with the museum, I ordered the exhibition catalogue, because I wanted, I wanted to get as close as I could without actually being there, and your videos of the inside of the hats and the making of the hat pin yes. really helped add an extra dimension to those of us stuck at home, not able to come out and see things. You, do you know one thing? I I love museums, and uh, it's wonderful. And if you, unless you can get into the archives and look at the hats, normally you don't see the inside of hats. For me, a greater uh, greater source of uh, inspiration and information is. Um, online hat shops uh, that sell vintage or eBay or whatever, because there's a gazillion photos of the inside <laughs> this way, that way, because they want to sell it. And yeah. so it's so well documented. I want to see the inside. <laughs> if, you, if you're in an exhibition of hats and you're there like on a stand, you know the millionaire because it's like the <laughs> looking <laughs> underneath. Yes, you can, you can play spot the milliner at the hat exhibitions. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm going to leave some links on this video down below to the V&A archive because the V&A archive lets you really zoom in on their images. And I think currently the V&A are actually moving their archive from their Kensington building to a new building, which I think is in Stratford. Um, that's not open yet, but once it is open, you will also be allowed to call up the archive and ask to see some specific hats if you want to go and handle them. And I'm sure there's plenty of other museums around the world that will let you do that as long as you're nice and you ask nicely. Yes, and also you cannot just say, I'm going, I want to see everything. No, yeah. it has to be, I want to see this one and this one and this one, and they will show them to you. I love 1930s hats because those people, and also 20s, but those people were not uh, afraid of using scissors. I mean, they were snipping here, uh, you know, and they're, they make these little hats, but you, they're cut every, there are many cuts in the field. I've, I'm so afraid of cutting field because once you cut, it's cut, there's no coming back. So I, I love those hats that are, you know, they, they're so cleverly made. Clever is the word, and they're so, so cute. There are two worlds, I think, the world of the cosplayer and the world of the millionaire. Um, and I think the cosplayers could really learn a lot. I, I'm sure a lot of cosplayers follow your, yeah. your channel. Cosplayers are great at experimentation. Yes. And I think a lot of milliners can learn that from cosplayers as yes, well. There, there should be more of an overlap there, mm. I think. Yeah, especially in the modern world of the internet where we are moving away from the kind of millinery closed sort of guild structure of keeping the knowledge secret because yes. in the world of sharing, I don't think there's really any pluses left in holding back knowledge. I think it's more about sharing it and also being aware of not to copy others that have shared their yes. knowledge. So people are sharing knowledge in good faith and then what you do is you take that knowledge and you think, well, how can I make it my own? Yes. Do your thing. <laughs> that seems to be your catchphrase. <laughs> it is because I think it's, it's more fun to do that. And my experience with millinery is that it was a world of gatekeepers, of people that didn't want to share their knowledge. They didn't want to let anyone in. 
<clears throat> there are the exceptions, like Mariana Jonkins, who's been in the business for 60 years, and she always wanted to share. She's amazing. Mm. Her book is fabulous. Oh, I've... and there's a second book <gasps> in the works. Oh. I don't know when it will be out, but they're working on it. You know, there are hats that are universal, and uh, you're not copying anyone if you make certain kind of hats. But if someone has a very specific design on Philip Tracy or just copying it is mm. it's wrong first of all and it's it's boring so yes i always think well it exists already so why make it again yes exactly i found that if if i do copy a hat it's more for me trying to learn the technique yes and then what i'll do is once i've made it i might take it apart again just so that what i've done now is i've learned the thing I've done the thing, I can now recycle the materials and reuse them. Because mm -hmm. the one thing I really don't like doing is wasting materials. No. I save every scrap. We all do. <laughs> we are the ultimate, you know, recyclers have bags of little scraps of felt. Millionaires don't throw anything away. <laughs> because it will come in handy and, uh, and you will be happy you had it. You mentioned earlier that you organized the Barcelona Hat Stroll. Yes. What's the hat culture like here? Who wears hats here? Very few people wear hats. <laughs> Why the hat stroll turned into this big event is beyond me. I don't know. We started with 50 people and uh, now we're around 2,000 people wow. participating, which is madness. That is a lot of people. It, so. And the variety on display. Oh, it's crazy it's yeah it's like from a normal hat a normal beach hat or a baseball cap those people usually the next year will upgrade to something better <laughs> but they just go around to check uh, what what's happening and then there's people that work all year to make their hats it's just like well, surely a bit like you off. with your peapod hat which is my, my peapod absolute hat favorite. was uh I'm always running behind and my peapot hat in my drawings has two peapots. Oh. There is one peapot. <laughs> you can imagine why, why is there one peapot? Because there was no time to make more and uh, I'm always finishing it two seconds the, the night before. Yeah. I had the suit that was Iris Apfel. Mm, For H&M. Correct. And uh, I saw that suit and I thought wow it's awesome I want it now have you worn it since no <laughs> <laughs> no I haven't I should but I haven't I'm a serial hat repeater once I make my one hat and I make it to match my one dress I then wear that continuously over and over again <laughs> I wore a few times again the a pink topper that I made to wear with a tuxedo that my friend made for me, Paco Peralta. And um, yes, that was, it was a stroll and then it was my birthday a few days after and family was here and we went to do some touristy thing and I was wearing my tuxedo by the way. And I said to my husband, are you ashamed to go with me? Because sometimes I, I'm paranoid that, I said, no, you look beautiful. Oh, he knows what to say. <laughs> we have a date for next year. Ah, amazing. Which is the 7th of April, which is a Sunday. On the 5th and the 6th, there will be materials market also. So people can buy materials. And this is with the help of the Spanish Millinery Association. I'll leave the links to all that down below. So do be sure to check that out. And also while you're down there looking at all the links, don't forget to like and subscribe and leave me and Christina a comment. We'll go back and read them all and, and see what you all have to say about Christina and her wonderful hats. Well, thank you so much for letting me into your workspace today. It's been such an honor to be here and finally meet you. It's been an honor to meet you, to Ilona, <laughs> because I've been following your channel and it's, it's wonderful. It's good to spread the word and you do that and you do it well. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you all so much for watching and I will see you next time. Bye.